what are the different types of loads how these loads are transferred in any structure today i will talk about loads and load paths this is the second part of lecture series on structural mechanics in structural mechanics we study behavior of a structure under mechanical loads understanding these loads and their path is absolutely critical for understanding the behavior of a structure after watching this video you will have broad understanding of loading and their load path on any structure hey friends if you're new here i'm dr javed qureshi a senior lecturer in structural engineering and design at a london university on this channel, we explore technical and human skills to help us lead more productive, happy and examine life. So the three things I will dive into today are applied loads, reaction loads and load path. What is the main function of a structure? The structure can be a building, it can be a bridge, it can be a car or a crane. A structure is device for channeling loads from one end to the other. For buildings, it is from roof all the way to foundations. As engineers, it is important to communicate loads really properly. If you happen to work on construction site, a very few people will understand what does it mean by one kilonewton. So what is one kilonewton? Is it bag of cement? Is it a small car? Is it a pen? Or a one kg bag of sugar? Remember, one kg is equal to 9.81 newtons. Roughly, I can say it is equal to 10 newton, which means that 100 kg will be equal to 1000 newtons or one kilonewton. So four bags of cement will be equal to one kilonewton. If you forget what is one kilonewton, then roughly it could be a weight of one adult person, which is about 80 to 90 kg. So 100 kg represents one person. Broadly, there are three kinds of loads. Natural loads that happen due to existence of a structure within this world. Useful loads are mainly occupancy loads that happen due to function or use of a structure. Accidental loads happen on rare occasions and these are due to misuse of a structure. Natural loads cannot be avoided. Useful loads must be tolerated. Accidental loads must be mitigated. Natural loads are divided into three categories. All structures resist gravity loads. These include self-weight, snow, and any non-structural components. These loads are mainly vertical. Lateral loads are horizontal loads. Wind and earthquake loads are typical examples. Other loads include earth or water pressure, temperature, and ground movements. All structures are subjected to gravity loads. They act through the body to the center of the earth. However, at a local level, these loads can be assumed to be vertical. Another example is wooden plank across a bridge. Here, the plank transfers load from the plank to the supports. Wind happens due to changes in atmospheric temperature on Earth. All structures have to resist wind forces. Near the ground level, wind flows along the surface. Any obstruction in wind path changes the pattern of wind flow, as you can see in this figure. Wind flows around the object and it depends on wind speed and shape of the object. Alteration of wind flow pattern causes a wind load. If the shape of object is rectangular, it can be idealized like this. If the object has sloping roof, the building will have these forces W1 and W2, 3 and 4. These forces act at right angle to the surface of the building. Arrow pointing inwards constitute windward side and forces pointing outwards are related to leeward side. Earthquake is caused by sudden internal movements within earth crust. This causes the earth surface to bounce up and down and move backwards and forwards. Vertical movements are usually smaller 
than horizontal movements. Earthquake cause horizontal loads similar to wind loads. And the loading that you will experience, it will look like this. If dry sand is piled up, there is a maximum slope for the sides. If the heap with a vertical side is required, like this one, then a retaining wall will be required to keep it into unnatural shape. As the heap of sand wants to return to its original shape, shown by dotted lines over here, the wall must hold back the sand above the dotted line. Earth pressure happens when a building has a basement or when a house or building is built into a sloping site. In that case, the structure has to resist natural loads from earth pressure. Under the earth's surface, there will be some water. The top level of this water is called water table. The level may be at the surface in swamps and beaches and many meters down in deserts. If the building interrupts natural water table, an unnatural water table is created around and under the building. The water pressure will cause upward loads on the building and the building will try to float. All structural materials expand when heated and contract when cooled. Structures are subjected to ambient climate. The temperature may change from a hot summer day to a cold winter night. For example, if two structures are connected by a spanning structure, like this one, as the temperature varies, the spanning structure will expand and contract depending on the temperature. Here it is expanding. This will push or pull two structures apart. Useful loads result from use or function of a structure. Consider a wooden plank which is spanning on the banks of a river. Its self-weight is a natural load. People crossing the river on the plank is a useful load. Most occupancy loads are classed as useful loads. An example include people moving in hospitals, people in houses, or people in libraries or universities. Most useful loads are vertical, but sometimes they can be horizontal. When we use structures to store sand, grain, or water, they cause useful earth or water pressure on the structure. Similar to earthquakes, machinery housed in a building can shake a building sideways, causing another type of useful horizontal load. Accidental loads include explosion, impact, fire exposure, and malicious attack. These loads are most difficult to predict. A detailed risk assessment should be carried out to mitigate these accidental loads. Natural, useful, and accidental loads are further classified into four different categories. Duration, direction, pattern, and timing. Duration can be permanent or temporary. Direction can be gravity or lateral. Pattern can be distributed, concentrated, and varying. Timing can be static or dynamic. Different loads can have four of these attributes discussed earlier. Dead load is a permanent, gravity, distributed, and static load. Imposed live or variable load is a temporary gravity load. Wind load is temporary, lateral, distributed, and dynamic load. Snow load is temporary, gravity, distributed load. Seismic load is a temporary, lateral, concentrated, or distributed, and dynamic load. Reaction loads. Reaction loads are equal and opposite to the applied forces. This is followed from Newton's third law of motion, which states that to every action, there is always an equal and opposite reaction. For example, a person standing on floor will result in equal and opposite action from the floor, which is termed as reaction. A person standing on a plank to cross the river will exert a vertical concentrated load on the plank. And detail is here. This is vertical load. And in this case, vertical load is off center. It is not applied at the mid span. This will result in more reaction on the left side as compared to the right side. Reaction is always required for equilibrium. 
This is classic example of horizontal reaction. The first diagram shows tug of war where people are pulling a rope. Here, it is unclear which is the load and which is the reaction. Applied load and reactions should be thought of as a balanced system of loads. In second diagram, pull of the team is applied load and tree provides a reaction. We don't always have only vertical and horizontal reactions. We have moment reaction as well. A moment is a force times distance. Moment is one of the least understood topic in engineering. It is because of moment that things can be weighed and people can enjoy seesaws. People can enjoy seesaw as long as they are of equal weight and sit at an equal distance from the support. This is due to moment equilibrium. Left person causes anti-clockwise moment and right person causes clockwise moment about the central support. Because both people are of same weight and are sitting at equal distance from support, the anti-clockwise and clockwise moments are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. So the system is in moment equilibrium. Same principle is applied to weighing scales. This time the unknown is weight of some goods. In first diagram, the signpost is acting as a vertical cantilever. The wind force acting at a height from the ground causes a moment at ground level. Many structures require more than one type of reaction. Using the same example, the support from the signpost provides vertical, horizontal, and moment reactions. In second example, the person sitting at the end of the cantilever causes a moment at the support. The support of the plank must balance the applied moment with a moment reaction. Otherwise, the plank will rotate away from the wall. For equilibrium, reactions must balance loads. Some of vertical loads must be equal to some of vertical reactions. Some of horizontal loads must be equal to some of horizontal reactions. Some of moments due to loads should be equal to some of moments due to reactions. If all of these are satisfied, then we call that the system is in equilibrium. Load paths. Load path tells us how loads are transferred through the structure. Load path is a sequence of loads and reactions between structural elements. Here, this is a frame. A point load is applied on the beam. This point load is transferred as wall reaction on left and right side. Load from that reaction is again taken on the column. And finally, that load is transferred to the ground and the ground provides reaction. This is how loads are transferred in a very simple frame. Load paths for a frame. Here, distributed load is applied, which causes shear and moment in the beam. From that distributed load, load is applied on this column, which is C or compressive load. Again, we, we reach here. Here, load is taken from the beam to the column and this column is carrying load from the column above and it is carrying load from the beam as well and finally it is transferred to the foundation. Load path for frame with cantilever. So here we have this cantilever portion. Again the same phenomena applies but here load from column is transferred to this cantilevered portion and this cantilever portion it carries UDL uniformly distributed load and it also carries load from column. And finally, moment and shear is transferred from the beam to the column over here, and this column is carrying compressive load, and finally it gets transferred to the foundation. Again, this is a very good example for load path for cantilever canopy. Here we have UDL applied, which is transferring downward load at this point, and this part is in tension because it's trying to stretch and it is transferring load upwards. This part is transferring load downwards and leftwards. The column here is taking compression and here this beam is taking uh, compression and finally uh, the column here is taking 
compression and column here is taking tension. So it is very important to understand which members are taking tension, compression, shear or moment. Here vertical distributed load is applied. We have pins over here. So pins means that they will not transfer any moment from the beam to the uh, column. So here only vertical load is transferred. So that's why we have compression over here. And then finally, the compression gets transferred over here. This member is not carrying any loading. How about if horizontal load is applied? When we apply horizontal load here, it is causing compression in this member. And this member is trying to stretch or it will have tension. And then again, this will have compression. And finally, we have tension and compression on the columns. Bracing, which is connecting these two elements, is a tensile member.